I'd like to talk through some details of the robot party exercise, specifically the online phase. So basically, once you have evolved a local behavior such that your set of robots can, in your own simulation, somehow have some kind of interaction, the idea is we're going to couple one of those robots to other student simulators via an MQTT server. So MQTT is a protocol for sending small real-time messages across the internet. And ID8 is now running a server that can allow us to exchange messages. Um, before I go on, I'll say we, there is a on the website a, uh, a page describing this MQTT monitor tool, which can be useful for debugging. It basically is a Python program, runs using Qt5 and a particular MQTT library. So it can connect to the server and show you all the traffic that's going by on given subscriptions and allow you to also to inject some traffic into that. So it is, a, it is a way to help debug how your system is, is working, see what's going on on the network, see um, how, how data is coming out. But the key ideas are there's a set of named channels on the server messages, and each, each channel has a, a name that's described by a path. And when you, when you, it's a publish subscribe system. So any message published on a given path will be received by any other listener listening to a, a subscription that includes that path. So this is all set up kind of behind the scenes. We'll see how that operates inside of the code. And the idea is your, the, your code should automatically connect to the server and uh, broadcast certain traffic and then receive other robot data. But if you need to see that happen, there is a tool that helps us to visualize that. So the sample world for this is called Network Party. It's included with the party package. Wow, that sounds great, party package. Uh, which is this Weeblots uh, project that is on the website. And it's a little more stripped down. I got rid of the clock. Um, but there's a couple of key things to note here. First of all, there's a series of gray objects. These are the proxy robots. And they're uh, basically stripped down versions of the wobbly robot. And there's also a new robot called Delegate. It's a supervisor robot. It has no corporeal form. It's just a robot that has sort of this disembodied behavior. And um, specifically, it is the robot that links the local radio network, simulated radio network, to the MQTT server. So the other robot code can run unchanged. Your robot can continue to run its you know, radio-based behavior trying to track other robots. Only now one designated robot from your herd will have its radio messages rebroadcast to the server. And then any other students who are at that moment running the code and logged in will receive those messages then the delegate will choose one of the proxy objects, proxy bodies here, to enact the position of the other students. So what we see here is inside of delegate is that it has a controller disembod, and it has a specific uh, custom data field with a name, wobbly1. So one of the wobbly robots is the chosen one. It has a name of wobbly1. Its data will get broadcast. The proxies um, do not start with any meaningful name. They're proxy1, proxy2. But those names will be filled in by the names of the other parties broadcasting on the network. So the hope is, and this is all a big experiment, we'll see how this goes, is that once there's interesting behavior running in, in one you know, system, is that simply providing some kind of connection to the other system will somehow disturb that and perturb that in some way. And we'll see some weird effects as a, a robot encountering one set of obstacles is broadcasting its position to another space where those obstacles don't exist, and it has sort of mysterious ghost-like behavior. And then the other robots in that space will just perceive it as a local robot along with the others, and then potentially interact with it. Whether this works, I don't know. And it's actually very hard for me to test in isolation. Uh, and so it's one of those things that we may see if it's a, a good idea or a bad idea, but it will get us some kind of network performance across the system. So let's look at a little bit more of the details here. First, the proxy body is a proto-object um, and I'll just say it has uh, essentially the sensors and, and other things stripped out of it. It has no controller. It's just, a, it's just an empty shell of a body that is turned into uh, a gray two-wheeled structure. And um, it is effectively controlled by the delegate. So the, the delegate is where all the action is. Um, and as I say, the delegate itself has no physical form. It's just, a, just a, an empty bodied robot. So let's look at its controller because that's where all the, all the interesting things happen. So the disembodied controller has a few things you may or may not need to change. Right in the top are a couple of constants defined that specify the host name of the ID8 server, the specific port we're going to use, and has a user and password field that for now you can just leave unchanged. 
The other thing that'll happen is, um, I'm sorry, in a second I'll say that. So again, this is a class-based example, although I will say the disemboweled class, um, this in this particular case, it, in, it inherits from supervisor because it's a specialization of the WeBot supervisor class to give it a little extra control. Um, once again, it is when it's when it is run, this this controller creates the object and then it simply calls two functions. It calls connect to set up the connection to the server, and then it calls its own run loop. So it's not that dissimilar. It's not that different from the um, the other wobbly code that I showed uh, it, for the actual robots. Um, only every, nothing it does has anything to do with the body. So let's look a little bit at what it's doing. First of all, in its initialization. Um, it does have a, a radio receiver and emitter to connect to the local network. That's the sort of primary hardware of this disembodied robot. Um, it does have some initialization to set up the MQTT. And there's, if you look in here under send topic, line 58 here, um, there's a string that's formed that defines the name of the topic on which your robot will broadcast. So for me, that would be party slash Garth Z. It's using my local username as a string to form a larger string, party slash Garth Z, which defines how my messages get broadcast. So that's the form that we'll choose. If on your machine, your, your Python does not report a meaningful user, um, then you might have to tweak this code manually to provide some more meaningful name there. But using Android IDs as a way to, uh, or some other kind of unique username, is simply a way to disambiguate who is who and provide unique topic paths which to broadcast. The other thing to note is line 53, the subscription is party slash hash mark. In MQ MQTT, hash mark is a wildcard. So party slash hash will simply listen to all messages which have party as the first element of their path, identifying the message topic, and then everything else after that will, can, be, can be variable. So this is listening on that particular channel. If you broadcast on some other you know, different prefix, this won't hear it. But for this particular exercise, we're using the subclass of party as, uh, as our topic names. So then there's some stuff to set up the client, which mostly has to do with the MQTT library and shouldn't have to change. And then a few, a few sort of elements that are, that are maintained here. One is there is a way that this particular supervisor robot has of locating the other proxy bodies in the scene by querying the scene tree and looking some things up. So it maintains some lists of available proxy bodies and then as it receives messages from the MQT network, MQTT network, it allocates those bodies for given names, and then those are used to kind of report the position of other, of other robots. Um, so there's some setup to make that happen. Um, and again, I hope that that doesn't, doesn't need to be customized at all. That should just work at this point. Um, you can see here in find proxies, there is, this is all the sort of WeBot specific stuff to kind of walk through the scene tree and simply locate those objects called proxy. One side effect of the way that it's done is that they have to stay as proto-objects. If you try to expand one of these proxy objects out into base nodes, um, it will no longer be found by the delegate. So that's just a, a side effect. Um, so that is kind of management of the proxy stuff itself. Let's look at the run loop now to see how this all comes together. So the run loop um, really just does two things. It pulls the simulated radio network, and then it pulls the, the MQTT network system. So the poll receiver is listening to the, um, the, for the other robots in the scene and then filtering out the messages that are for the chosen robot and rebroadcasting those. And the fact is that since the message that's transmitted has the same sort of text representation as the messages on the local radio network, it doesn't have to do much to create a, a network message from the local radio traffic. So what it primarily does is it does a little bit of error checking and then it pulls the robot name out of the um, uh, out of the string because that's not transmitted. The 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 data that's transmitted uses your username to identify you on on the network, not the actual name of the robot. The name of the robot is only used to decide which of these robots to rebroadcast. And then there's a there's a little bit of Python data manipulation here. Line 192 is a join that kind of puts the packet back together after it's been parsed apart. And then the publish is what actually sends it out to the network. So there's not, it doesn't actually look like a lot of code, but this actually is receiving a string, checking to see if it's the right robot to send, uh, sort of reconstructing the right string to send from the pieces of the first one, and then republishing them on the MQTT, MQTT network. And then it goes out across the socket to the server, and then anyone else listening will get the data. If no one is listening, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, but that's kind of, actually it comes back to you, but that's a different detail. 
So that is that is sort of pulling the local radio network. And um, let's look now at the at the client loop, um, which is the pulling the the network system. Now the MQTT library uses a callback system to handle data. So calling loop just says run one iteration of the network event loop, which is a separate event loop. And back up when we set things up, we attached a couple of callbacks so that when a message is received, our own on underscore message function is what's called. That's line 63 there. So the client will provide callbacks back to our object. And this is exactly where the Python object-oriented structure pays off, because having a single callback um, automatically provides the handle to the object itself, so on message has access to all the state variables. And this is precisely when the using the Python class object system uh, works much better with this third-party code. So let's, let's look at how those messages are received. We look go down now to on message. Um, here it is. Um, so it does a little bit of logic just to sort of fill, you know, check traffic. It it looks at the topic, and basically because this client is subscribed to party slash wildcard. It will receive its own transmission. So I send on party slash to Z, I also receive those messages. And so this is a little bit of logic to just filter out my own traffic so I don't, I don't respond to my own messages. So that's a couple of lines there. And then the text that's received from the network is parsed. And it's treated as a binary string. It's parsed into space separated tokens. And then some error checking is applied. And uh, hopefully this is enough to you know, catch any really malformed data. And once, when, when one is receiving data from the network, one has to always be careful to have very robust code to not interpret and do something crazy. So at worst, someone can send us a badly formatted float number here, and we would uh, get an exception. But there is some kind of uh, try accept to try to catch you know, parsing uh, problems so badly formatted data won't get very far, um, and we'll simply throw an exception here. And so. Um, when the string is, re is, is received, it's parsed back into the numbers. Um, it's sent as text. The float for X and tokens is a, is a Python-esque way of converting a list of strings back into a list of floating point numbers and then assigning it to some variables. And then this lo local set proxy pose function is called. In some sense, that's a very WeeBot specific uh, primitive that we use up above here, which um, takes a XYZ location in space and a heading value and then applies that to the proxy body by manipul directly manipulating the state of the body within the simulator. And then also, the um, uh, once a packet is received from the outside world, it's not only used to, to render by uh, updating the proxy body so that it moves in space and is available for collisions, but it's also the data is retransmitted on the local radio network so that the other models, the other robots in the same world, um, will also see the remote robot. And the name could give it away there because it's used. The remote name is used. Um, you know, the, basically the user identity is used to identify the ghost robot on the local network. So certainly, if your robot sees an unknown name, it could be that it's an outsider, not one of the local herd. Um, if you chose to respond to that. So just to sort of cap off here, the delegate is listening for messages from other robots. If there's no problem with operating or transmitting, it won't do much. When it sees a message that's from the select robot, it rebroadcasts that across the network so that anyone, anyone on the planet subscribed to this set of topics can possibly see that data. Um, if it receives a message from the network um, that is not from itself, it will parse it to get, the, once back, uh, get back out the XYZ location and the heading of that other, other remote robot. It will then ap apply it to one of the proxy bodies if available. If it runs out of proxy bodies, it ignores it. And then it will... Um, retransmit that locally on the local radio network so the other local submissions can see that ghost robot and potentially respond to it. The proxy will, will show up as, a, as if it were a robot locally. And in some sense, this should all just work. I hope that you do not have to touch this code. Hopefully, it's robust enough just to work. Um, I've tested it somewhat locally, but of course, there's things are going to crop up and we'll have to deal with that. Um, so that's pretty much it. I think the idea here is once you get to the state that your local herd has some interesting behavior, um, I welcome you to load up the network party and try out your controller with it to see what happens. I, I do recommend that you uh, try running the MQTT monitor uh, utility program to basically also listen to the message traffic and see if you can see your own data going back out. You could manually inject messages as if they were from a second robot um, in the bottom fields of this of this monitor application, there's a topic you can enter and a, and a place to enter some data. So you could simulate the sort of 
X, Y, Z heading values coming back from the other robot, actually name X, X, Y, I'm sorry, just X, Y, Z uh, heading is on MQTT. Um, so you can simulate being another robot manually as a way to test things. And then in principle, you should see the, the proxies moving around and see some kind of effect from the remote robot. And then my hope is when we all simultaneously run our controllers at some point, perhaps during the, next, the class after that, that we can see some kind of amusing effect occur where the remote robot somehow disturbed the effects of the local, local herd.